The Tom Woods Show, episode 1105. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you thought Bernie Sanders and his ideas would just go away, boy, have you been proven wrong. Best way to fight back? Grab my free ebook, Bernie Sanders is Wrong, over at BernieIsWrong.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. All right, I'm on a little bit of a communist kick lately since my talk at the University of California at Santa Barbara that I summarized a bit for you yesterday, but I teased you a bit by not going into much depth about the Russian Revolution. So I'm going to do that today. And what I've done is I've taken the several lessons that I devote to this subject in the courses in the Western Civ since 1493 course that I did for the Ron Paul curriculum, and I've kind of brought them together into one episode. So I've tried to do this seamlessly so you don't hear me saying goodbye after each one and hello at the next one. I've tried to make it seamless. A couple of times maybe there's a transition from one topic to another that's a little bit strained. That's just because I'm trying to put lessons together. But anyway, I took all that and I made an episode out of it, and I think you'll like it. This is, um, again, a taste of what I teach in the Ron Paul curriculum which is a K-12 through self-taught homeschool curriculum, which we in the Woods household use and have had a lot of success with. You can get this material if you're in the Ron Paul curriculum. You just, just buy my course on Western Civ. I have two Western Civ courses and a government course. So you can join it at ronpaulhomeschool.com, which is where you also get my bonuses. If you don't want to join the Ron Paul curriculum, but you'd like to get this course anyway, you can get it a la carte, at TomWoodsHomeschool.com, and you also get it as, well, there are other ways of getting it. You could become a, a gold or platinum supporter at SupportingListeners.com. You could become a master member subscriber at LibertyClassroom.com. Lots of ways to get this particular course that the stuff on the Russian Revolution you're going to hear today is drawn from. I will have the several ways of grabbing this thing up and listed and linked to at TomWoods.com slash 1105. So here we go. I hope you enjoy this. Hi, everybody. It's Tom Woods, and this week we're going to be talking about the Russian Revolution, one of the most important and significant and far-reaching events of the 20th century. So we're going to take our time going through it. It's an extraordinary event. There will be things happening that you will scarcely be able to believe as I describe them to you. In order to do this, we're going to have to revisit a little bit some material that we've covered in the past. You'll recall that we spent four lessons on Marxism some time ago in this course, and I'm going to need uh, for you to recall some of that material now, because we're going to see the application of some of those Marxian ideas to reality, to real-world situations, but in a modified way. Instead of Marxism, pure Marxism, we're going to see something called Marxism-Leninism because a man we're going to look at a little bit later in this lesson named V.I. Lenin or Vladimir Ilyich Lenin is going to modify Marxism to an extent. So his version of Marxism becomes popularly known as Marxism-Leninism. But in order to understand Marxism-Leninism, we have to recall some basic ideas from Marxism. You'll recall that Karl Marx believed he had identified certain laws of history there were certain events, certain sequences of events that were bound to take place. Now, he didn't know exactly what individual was going to do what or which war was going to break out where. He was not aiming at that level of specificity. Instead, Marx believed that he had decoded the basic course of history, the basic contours of how history has to proceed. And he believed that history was a series of class struggles, of one class struggling with another. And out of these struggles emerges a new kind of society. And then in this new kind of society, still other class struggles emerge until finally we arrive at the communist society in which there no longer are any classes and therefore there are no more class struggles and therefore there is nothing left to propel history forward. That is to say, there are no further stages for history to pass through. Now that we've reached the classless society, the society that has no social classes, 
Therefore, there are no class struggles if there are no classes. And so there is no new society that's given birth by any class struggle. The society remains the same. And so the ultimate end of society, end meaning goal in philosophy, end means thing you're aiming at. The end of society, the end of history is the reaching of communism. And then that's it. That's, that's where history has been aiming all this time. He believed, moreover, that the second to last stage of history would be the capitalist stage. Now, I suppose we could divide the socialist and communist stages into, into two, but leaving that peculiarity aside, we'll say that capitalism is the second to last or penultimate stage of history. That under capitalism, more and more people become part of the industrial proletariat, the working classes. And given the nature of capitalism, according to Marx, people in that class become more and more miserable over time. They become more and more impoverished, more and more helpless. And eventually, the situation becomes so intolerable that the impoverished masses rise up, overthrow it, and replace it with the classless society of communism. This is bound to happen, Marx says. It's bound to happen because of that. It's bound to happen because capitalism, like all other failed systems before it, becomes a fetter on the existing system mode of production. So that is to say, in capitalism, for example, you have according to Marx, inherently boom and bust cycles. The economy is doing well, then it's doing badly, then it's doing well, then it's doing badly. He says this is just the way capitalism is. That's one of the features of capitalism, that you go up and down all the time in terms of your economic fortunes. But he would say that that proves that capitalism can't make full use of resources because you have these periods when the economy is in the dumps and people are out of work. So their labor is being wasted. They're just sitting around doing nothing. Or all those factories we built are just sitting there. Nobody's working in them. They're just sitting there doing nothing. So capitalism becomes a fetter. They be it becomes fetters on the means of production. And therefore, because capitalism is a fetter on the productive forces, and, and because the productive forces can't be fully exploited and fully used, then this goes to show that, that this stage of history, now that capitalism has fully come into its own, it's fully developed, and all its perversities are on full display for all to see, it is time now for the new system to come along, socialism slash communism, to replace it. So let's realize what this means. First of all, Marx believes that this is all bound to happen. This is all inevitable. It can't be stopped. It is bound to happen. These are the laws of history. You can't stop the laws of history. So there's no point trying to fight against it. And you might be able to accelerate it a bit, but by and large, it's going to happen on its own. So you, you let it happen. Then secondly, it's going to happen after capitalism reaches its highest stage. Then you get the immiseration of the industrial proletariat. You get the crystal clear point that capitalism is allegedly a fetter on the productive forces. And then capitalism gets overthrown. Now we're going to see that in these, on these two critical points, Lenin, whom we will see in just a moment, is going to revise Marxism. He's going to make corrections to how, how the Marxist scheme is in fact going to be worked out in reality. So please bear all this material in mind, just in the back of your mind as we proceed. Let me say a brief word, a very brief word about the revolution of 1905. Really, when we talk about the Russian Revolution, there are three revolutions. There's the Revolution of 1905, and then there are two revolutions in 1917, the February Revolution and the October Revolution. Now, by and large, when people talk about the Russian Revolution, they're talking about the October Revolution uh, of 1917. That's really what they have in mind. But strictly speaking, there are three revolutions, which is why sometimes you will see, uh, you know, clever textbook authors, you know, who think they're showing how dumb everybody else is, call this chapter the Russian revolutions to make clear that we know that they know there was more than one. Well, okay, there, there was more than one. By far the least 
significant of the of the three would be the revolution of 1905, which is why I'll just say a brief word about it. I'll put a little uh, bit of reading on this in your reading for this week so that we can just pass over it here quickly and get into the, the, the meteor stuff. But in 1905, there are a series of, of a widespread demonstrations, public demonstrations on the part of a wide variety of people on the, and on behalf of a, a variety of grievances, national grievances, economic grievances, political grievances, and eventually – the response is the establishment of something called the Duma, D-U-M-A, which is a legislative body that is now introduced into Russian government that is not especially influential or powerful, but it had not existed before. The Tsar exercised really absolute power. In the West, the West had started to move away from absolutism sometime earlier, but it persisted in Eastern Europe and particularly in Russia. Well, even after the revolution of 1905, the when you get the, the constitution of 1906, that simply codifies the absolute power of the Tsar. But on the other hand, there is this institution called the Duma, which over time could, uh, some people hoped, develop into a real live source of challenge and opposition to, to the Tsar and his absolutist rule. So we get these mi relatively minor changes in the sense that they're minor in that the Tsar continues to exercise more or less absolute power uh, even in the wake of this. Let's say something now about World War I and Russia. Initially, the Russians were very enthusiastic about World War I, and in many places they continued to be even a long time into the war. You see uh, still plenty of enthusiasm for the war, and that's uh, – that's interesting given all the hardships the Russians endured during the war, uh, particularly those who were on the front lines. The Russian soldiers, for example, were so ill-equipped that, th that many of them were sent out to the front uh, without weapons. A approximately 25% of the Russian soldiers were sent out there without a gun. Now there you are going out to fight the Germans in World War I and you have no weapon. Well, the instructions you were given – were that when you encounter dead Russian soldiers in the process of fighting or on your way there, they probably have guns. You should take those and use them. Well, that's pretty demoralizing. But what's more, especially as 1917 goes along, uh, more and more grievances that are war-related begin to accumulate. We've got uh, millions of peasants conscripted uh, into the army. The remainder – had enormous demands for food placed upon them. There were compulsory purchases by the government, uh, sometimes at unreasonable prices from the peasants' point of view. There were rising food prices that then led to conflict between the city and the countryside. People living in the city thought that the peasants were just gouge gouging them and being unreasonable in the prices that they were asking for for food. The Bolsheviks, who are a species of communist, they're the group of communists who will take over in the October Revolution, will exploit this unrest. Uh, in fact, it becomes really a, a rule of thumb that the Bolsheviks will exploit any situation whatsoever, make whatever promises they need to make to whatever group, even when they have absolutely no intention of carrying them out. The Bolsheviks pretended to be the friends of the peasants. If that's what it took to get into power, even though they thought the peasants were backward, reactionary, superstitious, uh, that they would someday simply take the peasants' lands away. But for the time being, they would talk about the need for the peasants to have land. The, the Bolsheviks would exploit the various nationalities that lived within Russia and say all these national groups, just as in the, the uh, Austrian uh, – Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, they should have their own – States, But, of course, the Bolsheviks had no intention of, of doing any such thing. They just simply wanted to get everybody, as many groups as they could, on their side. So let's move now to the February Revolution. Now, this may seem odd because I know you can read, and I know you see on the slide that it says March 1917. March 1917. What is Woods talking about? Why is it the February Revolution when I can obviously see the word March? The answer has to do with the different calendars – 
that the Russians had as compared to Western Europeans and the calendar that uh, basically all of you watching this, uh, pretty much everybody has now. It was There was a calendar reform that the West had gone through a long time earlier, but the Russians had not. And because of the different calendars, the Russians were in February at the time, but for, for us, it's March. So we call it the February Revolution because it took place in February in Russia. Likewise, the October Revolution took place in what we would call November. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will call them the February and October Revolutions, but you'll understand if I am referring to March and November. That doesn't matter, okay? You can go through the rest of your life never thinking about that again, but I just thought I would clarify it because it is staring you right in the face. A key event that is going to usher in the February Revolution is a mutiny in the Petrograd garrison where uh, troops are stationed. As in 1905, you have a series of demonstrations by people who are unhappy with the government, uh, with their economic conditions. Uh, they're unhappy for various reasons, and they demonstrate. Well, there was a Russian regiment that fired on a crowd that refused to disperse, and the result was 40 civilian casualties. This sparks the Petrograd mutiny, a mutiny of soldiers in the Petrograd garrison. Uh, these soldiers were unhappy for a variety of reasons. They were a tinderbox waiting to go up in flames. There were 160,000 men in that garrison packed into quarters that had been designed for a mere 20,000 men. So there were eight times as many people stuffed in there as the facility had been designed for. So already people are unhappy. A lot of these are peasant draftees, and their view was that for various reasons they should have been exempt from military duty, and after all, they're growing food. And as the demonstrations grow larger, these peasants refuse to fire on the unruly crowds. Well, in this situation, the Tsar, is, Tsar Nicholas II, is urged to abdicate, that is to step down, to defuse the situation. It is a revolutionary situation. People are, a uh, great many people are increasingly unhappy with the czar. Uh, and there had been, uh, by the way, this was a long time coming. For a long, long, long time, the mainstream view was that the czar is there to help us and to protect us. And if things are going badly, it must be because the czar is being misinformed by his corrupt advisors. But he couldn't possibly know what conditions are really like or he would do something. Well, there is some, some anger at the czar. And so it's the February Revolution that sees the Tsar removed, or the Tsar basically removes himself. It's not the communists, if you're vaguely familiar with the Russian Revolution, it's not the communists who drive out the Tsar. It's this, it's this group. It's the February 1917 Revolution and a group calling itself the Provisional Government. They're the ones who get rid of the Tsar. The Provisional Government is full of all kinds of, of people. There are liberals in the classical sense, the sense in which we talked about when we talked about liberalism in this course. There are what are called social revolutionaries, people who favor the cause of the peasants. There are socialists. There's a variety of different types of people who are involved in the provisional government. It's headed by a man named Alexander Kerensky, who was a passionate speaker, although it was hard to figure out really what his views were. He doesn't seem to have had particularly well thought out views. But what I want you to recall is that the czar, who had been the absolute ruler of Russia, simply abdicates. And he even says privately, if this is what it takes to keep order in Russia and to save Russia, then I will, I will indeed step down. And he does that. So this is what overthrows the czars. It's the communists are going to overthrow the provisional government. They're going to overthrow this government, the government that overthrew the czar will get overthrown by the communists. Now the provisional government is going to, first of all, it's going to, it's going to be a divided regime because on the one hand you have the provisional government, but on the other hand you have these workers councils around Russia called Soviets. And the Soviets are going to also claim that they have power. So it's going to be an awkward situation. The Soviets claim to be governing, the provisional government claims to be governing. The Soviets don't really want to do the grunge work of day-to-day -day administration and bureaucracy, so that tends to be uh, 
undisputed and and, and uh, clearly held by the provisional government. But just bear in mind that there are these workers' council called Soviets that are a kind of a challenge to the provisional government to deal with. The provisional government is going to continue prosecuting the war. It's going to keep Russia in World War I. And we should bear in mind that although there was some opposition to World War I at this point in Russia, it has been exaggerated by historians. The February Revolution was by and large a soldier's rebellion. It was not primarily a rebellion by industrial workers, as you sometimes see it portrayed. That's simply, there's no evidence for that. It was a soldier's revolution. And these soldiers wanted to see the war fought more efficiently, more effectively. They did not want to withdraw from the war. They wanted, to be, they wanted it to be fought better. And that's what the provisional government aimed to do. But as the war became more unpopular, this strategy became more unpopular of staying in the war and just trying to fight it more effectively. Provisional government also promised that there would be held elections to a constituent assembly, a legislative body. Because after all, who's the provisional government? Just a bunch of people. So they were promising that there would be elections to a constituent assembly. The Bolsheviks exploited that too. And they said, nobody in that provisional government really wants to hold an election for a constituent assembly. They're just snowing you people. They're not really going to ever hold those elections. The only people you can trust to hold those elections are the Bolsheviks. So the Bolsheviks would say and do and promise whatever they needed to promise in order to get power. And then once they got power, they couldn't care less about whatever promises they made to the public. So let's talk now about this character, V.I. Lenin, who's going to be so very important. As you can see here on the slide, Lenin's brother was executed for his role in plotting the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. And a lot of people have concluded from this that that experience must have radicalized Lenin and that that's why he became a communist and he became so active in all this sort of activity. But there's really no evidence for this. He, he Even after the execution of his brother, he showed no interest in politics whatsoever. Later on, Lenin is going to himself be expelled from a university uh, for, for demonstrating, basically just demonstrating against some university regulations, and he couldn't get admitted elsewhere. Basically for four years, he was shut out of academia. Eventually, they allow him to be accepted into law school, but he spends these four years basically reading radical literature and, and becoming more and more interested in Marxist thought, revolutionary thought, and so on. Before we go on to what's on this slide, let me read to you a passage from what an acquaintance of Lenin had to say about him. His principal disposition was hatred. Lenin took to Marx's doctrine precisely because it resonated with that principal disposition of his mind. The doctrine of class war, relentless and thoroughgoing, aiming at the final destruction and extermination of the enemy, proved congenial to Lenin's emotional attitude to surrounding reality. He hated not only the existing autocracy and the bureaucracy, not only lawlessness and arbitrary rule of the police, but also their antipodes, in other words, their exact opposites, the liberals and the bourgeoisie. That hatred had something repulsive and terrible in it. It was abstract and cold like Lenin's whole being. Now, very interesting testimony. What do we see here on the slide? This is a short work written by Lenin, Lenin in the year 1902. And it was called, What is to be Done? And here Lenin is thinking about and reflecting on strategy. What is the proper strategy for communists who want to see the communist revolution? Now, remember the Marxist strategy was really, you didn't have to have a strategy, strictly speaking. You might be able to push the revolution forward, but not much. It has to occur on its own timetable and on the timetable of the laws of history as they are worked out in real life. Marx is not going to say that what you need to do is push history forward through active efforts, that the workers on their own are not enough. But that is going to be the lesson of Lenin. According to Lenin, left to themselves, the proletariat, the working class, 
will never rise up in revolution. The working class is too short-sighted to see the need for this. The working class will simply try to collaborate with the system, try to come up with compromises with the system, but they will always simply work within the existing system. So maybe they'll join a trade union, a labor union or something, and they'll think of themselves as really sticking it to the man by joining a labor union. But joining a labor union is so not what Lenin wants them to do because a labor union will just make them want to get a little bit more, you know, get paid a little bit more in the current system. No, we don't want that. We're communists. We want to overthrow the whole system. We don't want to just throw them a few more crumbs. They're still proletariat, and they're still proletarians working in a, in a capitalist system and being exploited by people who, uh, who rule over them economically and otherwise. So we don't want that. We don't want trade unions. Are just, This is hopeless. That's not what we want. We want to overthrow the whole system, not just become more comfortable within it. So what do we do then? What we do is establish what Lenin called a vanguard of the proletariat, a class of professional revolutionaries. Now, you can't have workers being the professional revolutionaries because by definition, they have to work all day. They don't have time for this. What we need is a vanguard of the proletariat, a group of people who will educate the workers, who will organize them, who will divert them away from their natural course of just going into trade unions or whatever and explaining to them what their role in history is and pushing them forward, propelling them into revolution. So these can't be workers themselves. The workers would never have time for this, even if they did have the consciousness that they needed to do it. So instead, it needs to be intellectuals. It needs to be professional thinkers, philosophers to organize the workers in this way. So these are not workers who are involved in this great project. Uh, Lenin's party, the Bolshevik party, only had only one worker who ever sat on it. And it turned out that one worker wasn't really a worker after all. He was secretly a police spy. So no workers were involved in this at all. Oh, Lenin and his people are deeply, deeply concerned about the workers, but there are no workers involved in this. Lenin's revolutionaries, his his cadre of, of revolutionaries, his vanguard of the proletariat, funded their operations through things like bank robberies uh, to get the money that they needed. As 1917 went on, the Bolsheviks were able to exploit the war's increasing unpopularity. And they could say this is another reason to oppose the provisional government. The provisional government, by the way, which, which had established freedom of speech and had done some things in the liberal tradition, th these things will, any liberal thing, liberal in the classical sense that we talked about in this course, any liberal thing the provisional government does, the Bolsheviks will immediately overturn. When the Bolsheviks take power in the November, in the October Revolution, they will get rid of freedom of speech, they'll get rid of freedom of the press um, as quickly as they think they can get away with it. As I said at the beginning of the lesson, the provisional government promises elections to a constituent assembly, but they keep putting off the vote. They keep putting it off farther and farther into the future. And so the, the Bolsheviks say, well, no wonder they're, they're postponing the elections. They don't actually want to hold the elections. If you really want to hold the elections, then support us. Support us against the provisional government. We'll get you those elections. As I mentioned briefly, the Bolsheviks promise self-determination to the various nationalities in Russia. They have absolutely no intention whatsoever of doing anything on behalf of those nationalities, but whatever they need to do to get support, they will do. Lenin is going to actually be brought to Russia by the Germans. The Germans, who are fighting against the Russians in the war, believe that a radical like Lenin could really throw a monkey wrench into the works of the provisional government. It could, he, he could really give them headaches. He could really give them troubles. And maybe he could stir up a revolution Lenin made clear he was against Russian involvement in the war. Uh, he, he didn't care what happened to Russia. R Russia should get out of the war immediately, even if it meant giving away a lot of territory, but it should get out of the war. So the Germans would love to see a guy like that come to power. So they, they actually brought him, physically brought him to Russia. So Le there were always rumors that Lenin was some kind of German agent. Well, in April 1917, Lenin publishes what were called the April Theses. There almost nobody supports them, even almost no communists, even, even 
um, not even a majority of his own Bolsheviks support the April Theses because they seem to be the ravings of a lunatic, the ravings of someone who is completely out of touch with reality. The April Theses consisted of the following, and this is uh, how uh, the historian Richard Pipes summarizes them. Renunciation of the war, immediate transition to the next phase of the revolution, denial of any support to the provisional government, transfer of all power to the Soviets, which the, of course, the Bolsheviks were, were intended to control, the dissolution of the army in favor of a people's militia, confiscation of landlord property and nationalization of all land. All land would basically be in the government's hands. Integration of Russia's financial institutions into a single national bank under Soviet supervision and Soviet control of production and distribution. So the entire economy in the hands of the Soviets, which in the way Lenin viewed the world would mean in the hands of the Bolsheviks. So a German agent in Stockholm observing Lenin's behavior wrote to the authorities in Germany and said, Lenin's entry into Russia successful. He is working exactly as we desire. So that's an overview of Lenin and his basic ideas in terms of strategy. Uh, but, of course, he's not in, in power yet. Uh, we've got Alexander Kerensky leading the provisional government. And he is losing support all over the place. He's losing the support of the peasants because of his demands for food from them. The provisional government begins to lose control in the countryside. He begins to lose control of the army. I'm going to give you a little reading on this matter of General Kornilov. There is some dispute among historians as to exactly what was going on here. And uh, Richard Pipes, my own favorite, has a kind of an outlying view on this subject. So I'll link you to something on that. All you need to know is for our purposes is that the provisional government is losing the support and confidence of the countryside and the army. And they need the support of the army. If the Bolsheviks should try to take over, they'll need the army. And as a matter of fact, they released, the provisional government releases some Bolsheviks from prison and arms them against the perceived threat of a military takeover by this General Kornilov. So all kinds of problems besetting the provisional government. The Bolsheviks wind up doing well in elections to the Soviets that I talked to you about, these, uh, these workers' councils. Well, to make a long story short, I'll have this, this will also be in your reading, but on November 7th, again, according to our calendar, because this is the October Revolution in, in the Russian calendar, the Bolsheviks took over all the strategic points in the capital. And they were able to take power with very little violence. It's astonishing how they got away with it. And by the way, for people who say there are no conspiracies in history, if the Russian Revolution wasn't a conspiracy, I don't know what else to say about it. There might have been, by that point in 1917, there might have been maybe 18,000 Bolsheviks in, in, among tens of millions of people. And they took over all the different places, all the different strategic points in the capital. What it, what would you use to describe that if not a conspiracy? That's what a conspiracy is. You have a tiny minority plotting to do something that probably a majority of the people don't want to have happen. Well, the victorious Bolsheviks, having astonished everybody by overthrowing the provisional government, basically bloodlessly, practically, then use this slogan, all power to the Soviets, that we want these workers' councils to be the locus of power. So it sounds like what they favor is grassroots democracy. You know, these local workers' councils are going to be running everything. But what was really going on there was that you had a dual authority. On the one hand, you had these councils, you had uh, these workers' councils, but it was just a facade, a facade of popular self-rule. What you really had was a dictatorship, a dictatorship exercised by the Communist Party. Uh, and this is really how they begin to talk about themselves, as the Communist Party. Now, there are other socialist parties. Uh, there were other people who favored communism, not just the Bolsheviks. But these other parties thought, look, even if the Bolsheviks take over, that can't possibly last. Uh, eventually, they're going to reach out to us and form a coalition with us. Why would they risk a civil war in Russia to fight all of us? Eventually, they're going to ask us for help. They're going to extend an olive branch. They're going to reach their hand out for cooperation from us. But that did not, in fact, happen. Uh, communism 
w did not emerge in Russia because there was a popular uprising. The people demanded communism. By no means. The, communism were, the communists were a tiny, 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 tiny minority. And the Bolsheviks were an even tinier minority than the communists. The Bolsheviks were one particular group of communists who favored Marxism-Leninism. And it came about because a small minority used these democratic-sounding slogans like all power to the Soviets. But what that masked was an absolute dictatorship. That's exactly how Lenin's party uh, developed. Let me read to you a passage from my favorite historian of the Russian Revolution, Richard Pipes. You would enjoy reading his book, A Concise History of the Russian Revolution, by the way. It reads like a novel, even though it's nonfiction. He says, viewing the Bolsheviks' power seizure from the perspective of history, one can only marvel at their audacity. None of the leading Bolsheviks had experience in administering anything, and yet they were about to assume responsibility for governing the world's largest country. Nor, lacking business experience, did they shy from promptly nationalizing, that is, having the government take over, and hence assuming responsibility for managing the world's fifth largest economy. They saw in the overwhelming majority of Russia's citizens, the bourgeoisie and the landowners as a matter of principle, and most of the peasantry and intelligentsia as a matter of fact, as class enemies of the industrial workers whom they claimed to represent. These workers constituted a small proportion of Russia's population, at best one or two percent, and of this minority, only a minuscule number followed the Bolsheviks. On the eve of the November coup, only 5.3% of industrial workers belonged to the Bolshevik party. So bear that in mind. Industrial workers are 1% to 2% of the Russian population. And of that 1% to 2%, only about 5% of that small minority supports the Bolsheviks. This meant that the new regime had no alternative but to turn into a dictatorship. A dictatorship not of the proletariat, but over the proletariat and all the other classes. The dictatorship, which in time evolved into a totalitarian regime, which, which means a regime in which the government controls everything, every, the economy, uh, politics is just a one-party system, or religion, culture, your thoughts, everything. The dictatorship, which in time evolved into a totalitarian regime, was thus necessitated by the very nature of the Bolshevik takeover. As long as they wanted to stay in power, the communists had to rule despotically and violently. They could never afford to relax their authority. The principle held true of every communist regime that followed, the same sort of principle. Lenin said that dictatorship, including that of the proletariat, was power that is limited by nothing, by no laws, that is restrained by absolutely no rules, that rests directly on coercion, that is the use of force. So over a decade of at least hints of constitutionalism in Russia now go completely by the wayside. There are indeed elections held to the Constituent Assembly. The Bolsheviks did keep that promise, but the Bolsheviks got only 24% of the vote. So the Bolsheviks allowed the assembly to meet for one day, and then the Bolsheviks disarmed it. But armed men came in and ordered everybody to disperse. They closed the constituent assembly, and that was the end of that. And this happened with very, very little outcry. The, the Russians at this point were exhausted. They yearned for peace and order. That's what they want. They were exhausted by revolution. They were exhausted by war. They were exhausted by struggles between the countryside and the city. They were exhausted. And the Bolsheviks benefited from that exhaustion. The government established by Lenin was known as the Council of People's Commissars. That was his uh, institution. It consisted entirely of Bolsheviks and had carried out the orders of the Bolshevik party. In the spring of 1918, the Bolsheviks did poorly in elections to the Soviets. They were defeated by other, uh, other uh, left-wing parties, the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries. So how did Lenin's regime deal with that? Well, they, de they dealt with it by either disqualifying Mensheviks and Social Revolutionaries from running for office ever again, or by just holding elections over and over again until the desired majorities of Bolsheviks 
were, uh, were obtained. Lenin then, in early 1918, made an unfavorable peace with the Germans, giving away vast amounts of territory so he could turn toward, toward uh, consolidating his own power. His view was eventually we'll regroup and we'll get these territories back. But right now, at all costs, we've got to get out of this war. This is known as the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. We've got to get out of this war because I can't wage a war. First of all, he was totally dead set against World War I from the start. This is an imperialist war. It doesn't benefit the working classes at all. Let's get out of it. He's got to turn his attention toward the million problems that he faces governing Russia at that moment. And boy, does he have problems. But there is not one problem that he does not make infinitely worse. Infinitely worse. Now, the Bolsheviks, being Marxists, believed that their system was scientific. Marx's claim had always been that his whole system was scientific. He had uncovered the laws of history scientifically, and all his propositions were scientific. And because they were scientific and because they were absolutely true, Lenin and the Bolsheviks could brook no opposition. What would be the point of allowing opposition? We're right. We have science behind us, so it would just be a waste of time and a, a stupid diversion of effort to have to deal with people who are too stupid to understand the truth, too uh, stupid to understand reality. And that became a feature of the Soviet regime, that uh, oftentimes dissidents would wind up in mental hospitals because there must be something mentally wrong with you if you don't see the merits of communism and you don't understand that this is the scientific system that is indeed uh, part of the laws of history. If you don't see that, there's obviously something wrong with you in the head. Now, because they believed so strongly that they were absolutely right, they could not admit error. They could not fundamentally admit error, even though their theory kept on failing them again and again. For example, what did Marx's theory say about the institution of the state? According to Marx's theory, the state has no interests of its own. The state is merely the instrument of the class that owns the means of production. So under capitalism, the state is the instrument through which the capitalists exploit their ownership of the means of production. They use the state apparatus to oppress the proletariat. That's what the state is for. The state is used by whatever the dominant class, social class, happens to be, and the state is then used to oppress the other classes. But the state is just an instrument by which the dominant class extends and carries into effect its domination. It's just an instrument. It has no interests of its own, separate from the dominant class. It, it is just their instrument. But in fact, as with all states, and as was becoming obvious in Russia, the state does have interests of its own. The bureaucracy of the state does have interests of its own and is not just concerned supposedly about the welfare of the workers or whatever. It becomes interested in its own welfare. The state has interests of its own apart from whatever the Bolshevik or Marxist ideology may say. It has its own interests. So you get a bureaucracy of people who serve the state because they want a salary and they want that salary to rise and they want their power to grow. A lot of these people couldn't care less about Bolshevism or Marxism or any of this. They couldn't care less about any of this. They want a nice cushy job. And so there's the state winds up getting an interest in expanding for its own sake, getting more power, getting more money for its own sake to benefit its employees. But the Marxists can't admit this because according to them, this, this can't happen. The state cannot possibly have independent interests, but yet it obviously does have an independent interest in expanding and its employees have an independent interest in building their own power base. And of course, a large bureaucracy of this kind was unavoidable, was absolutely inevitable. If the state is going to take over all industry, all education, all transportation, all retail and wholesale trade, and so on and so forth. How could you not expect a gigantic bureaucracy to grow up in order to administer all this? And in fact, this is really where Joseph Stalin, a figure uh, that will be discussed later in the course, Joseph Stalin, the, the, the really great monster uh, 
even much worse even than Lenin in the history of Russian communism, he was appointed the general secretary of the Communist Party at this time. The, the Bolsheviks come to call themselves just the Communist Party. And among Stalin's tasks was to keep an eye on the state and state employees and the bureaucracy, but it was just an impossible task. It really did develop separate interests of its own. Key bureaucrats, for instance, enjoyed special privileges. They would get special food, special hospitals, resorts, even special cemeteries. How about another area of Marxist theory that is obviously disproved by the experience of Russia, but again, no one's allowed to admit it. Socialism, according to Marx, is supposed to be more efficient than capitalism. Well, let's see what the actual outcome was. Let's look at the various planks that were indeed instituted of communism, although it was called war communism, and, and it really was not, in fact, related to war. Let's, uh, let's make clear about this term, war communism. As the tenets of communism sh proved to be obvious failures, just one after the other were obvious failures, the economy is a total shambles after these principles were instituted. Well, later on, the communists started referring to these principles as the principles of war communism. They tried to, impl they tried to imply that these principles, well, we put these into effect because, you know, it was the pressures of war because there, there is going to be a Russian civil war, and they're going to claim that, well, you know how war is. You have to take a lot of emergency measures, and so we had no choice but to do these things. So they, they try to make it sound as if these crazy, whacked-out things that we did <clears throat> that destroyed the economy and led to a famine, well, these were due to the pressures of war, and what are you going to do during war, right? You know, you got to do what you got to do. That's what they try to argue. But in fact, uh, this was just a, a, a later rationalization. This really was just plain old communism. In fact, uh, Leon Trotsky, who was a close uh, colleague of Lenin, himself said these principles are aimed at helping Russia toward, quote, realizing genuine communism. He didn't say, well, these are just principles we had to implement because of the pressures of war, and sometimes you just got to get tough during war, and the government power has to grow, and that's just one of the prices you pay of wartime. No, he said, this is just plain old communism. That's what's happening here. So let's look at some of these principles. And these are principles of war communism, or as I say, just plain old communism, as summarized by historian Richard Pipes. First, the nationalization. Nationalization means the government takes it over. The nationalization of the means of production and transport. So all the things that go into producing goods, factories and whatever, nationalization of that, nationalization of transportation. The liquidation of private commerce through the nationalization of retail and wholesale trade and its replacement by a government-controlled distribution system. The government will, will, dis, will distribute goods instead of the traditional, you know, buying and selling of things. There'll be rationing and so on. The abolition of money. They're going to try to get rid of money. I mean, what a bunch of idiots. They're going to try to get rid of money as a unit of exchange and accounting in favor of state-regulated barter. Then they're going to try to impose on the economy a single plan for the entire economy, one plan cooked up by planners. Then the introduction of compulsory labor, that is forced labor, for all able-bodied male adults and on occasion also women and children. Well, how did this all turn out? Well, the factories were hopelessly mismanaged, but how could it be otherwise? As we noted last time, the Bolsheviks had absolutely zero experience running anything. No business experience, no, no experience at all. Meanwhile, the underground economy, the illegal economy, grows larger than the official one. Because remember, now the exchange of goods and services is basically being dominated by the government and production and economic planning and so forth. So what do you expect is going to happen? The, the goods people want aren't being produced or they're being produced in, in, in inadequate quantities or they're not allowed to have the quantities that they want. Uh, the government won't allow them to have the quantities that they want. So people just start providing things that they need in, in secret. And, and that, that's the underground economy. The regime tries to get rid of money through hyperinflation, through extreme inflation. So imagine a situation in which prices go up by 100 million times. 
Well, that's what happened in the hyperinflation period here. By 1923, hyperinflation has created a situation in which prices have indeed risen by 100 million times as compared to before the Bolsheviks took power uh, in 1917. Large-scale industrial production in 1920 was only 18% of what it had been in 1913, a complete catastrophic collapse. Look at coal output. Coal output drops to 27% of where it had been. Iron drops to an anemic 2.4% of where it had been. The number of employed industrial workers in 1921 was less than half of the level of 1918. Now remember, remember one of the claims of Marxism was that capitalism can't make full use of the productive forces, including labor. And yet here's communism, and it has less than half the employment level of 1918 after three years. So which system is in fact incapable of making full use of the existing resources? The standard of living fell by two thirds Workers lose the right to elect union officials and to strike. You think, how could that be? Isn't the whole Bolshevik revolution all about helping the workers? Well, yes, uh, at least that's how they, they uh, portrayed it. But the argument that the government made was uh, uh, is that well, you now live in a worker's paradise. You, you live under communism. I mean, this is the, this is the ideal system. And the regime is here to help you like that. It's all about you. So why would you possibly ever need to strike against the system? You'd just be striking against yourself. You are the system now. So it's it's basically crazy Rousseau uh, type thinking, uh, as I talked about in the uh, in the government course for for the Ron Paul curriculum, uh, Government One B. One communist observer, note this is a communist observer, called all this a disaster quote unparalleled in the history of mankind. How does Lenin respond to all this by saying, well, maybe we better rethink some of our ideas. You know, maybe this is, maybe we were wrong about something. No, 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 no. His response is the firing squad, to typical communist response. We'll root out the, the class enemies who are sabotaging communism, comrade. That's his response. Isaac Steinberg, the communist commissar of justice, asked Lenin once, why do we bother with a commissariat of justice? Let's call it the Commissariat for Social Extermination and be done with it. And Lenin replied, his face suddenly brightened, and he replied, well put, that's exactly, that's exactly what it should be. But we can't say that. Meanwhile, Lenin faces another major economic problem, a drop in food production. The Bolsheviks hated the peasants. They viewed them as the class enemies of the industrial workers. They had no sympathy for them whatsoever. They are not part of the revolutionary class, which is the industrial workers. So they believed that the peasants were class enemies of the workers, even though most workers themselves had come from the villages and maintained close ties to them. Lenin, of course, is carrying through the period known as the dictatorship of the proletariat that Marx had envisioned. But unlike in Marx's scheme, where most people belonged to the proletariat, Lenin had launched his revolution at a time when only 2% of the country was industrial workers and 75 to 80% were peasants. So the dictatorship of the proletariat meant the dictatorship on behalf of a very tiny minority. And of course, it, it doesn't even benefit the industrial workers themselves, but it's a very, very tiny minority against pretty much everybody. What the Bolsheviks want is to seize food for the Red Army, for their army and to get a foothold in the countryside, which had been largely untouched by Bolshevik influence. The Bolsheviks had had pretty much no influence in the countryside. They had no following there, and they want to establish themselves, and they want to become powerful, and they want to have access to that most important commodity, food. So they send armed detachments to the countryside. Instead of just buying and selling like normal people, they're just going to go take stuff and they urge peasants to report hoarders, because that's all Lenin can think. There must just be hoarders in the countryside. There must be rich peasants who want to keep all the food for themselves and refuse to give it to the workers in the cities. So please tell on your rich neighbors. Now, there were divisions in the countryside, it's true, between some peasants and other peasants. 
But if there was one thing that could bring them all together in unity, it was being told to tell on their neighbors. They are not doing that. And so the result was a civil war, a massive civil war of resistance in the countryside against this snitching program and against these armed detachments come to take their excess food, supposedly excess food. Vladimir Brovkin was a, a very important scholar. Uh, he wrote a book called The Mensheviks After October. Uh, he, as far as I know, he's still alive, but he's a 20th century scholar of Russia. And according to him, the real civil war in Russia was against the Greens. When you read a textbook, they're going to tell you all about the civil war against the so-called whites. And they're going to tell you about it all wrong. They're going to say the whites were people who were fighting against the Bolsheviks because they wanted to restore the czar. Now, it's true that the white army officers indeed had monarchist tendencies, but the whites were not at all looking to restore the czar. They wanted the old provisional government back. They wanted the insanity of Bolshevism overthrown. But the real civil war was against the Greens. So whenever you read a textbook that tells you all about the civil war on the whites and doesn't mention anything about the Greens, the Greens was another name for the peasants, you know you're reading something that's out of date, that is not up with recent scholarship. Vladimir Brovkin was my own professor at Harvard when I was studying 20th century Russia. He was unbelievably anti-Bolshevik. I've never seen anything like it. Incredibly anti-Bolshevik. So, by the way, people who think Harvard must have been a bastion of pro-communist sympathy, not in the Russian history department, absolutely not. Not in the Center for Russian Studies, absolutely not. You had Vladimir Brovkin, extremely anti-Bolshevik, Richard Pipes, extremely anti-Bolshevik, and at one time or another, they had Adam Ulam, who was a great biographer of Stalin. Now, what do you think people are going to do when they're told, we're going to come take any excess food as defined by us? We'll define what's excess food. Well, you're just, you're just going to plant less so they'll find less excess. So the peasants reduced the acreage on which they planted in order for the, there would be less so-called surplus for the Bolsheviks to grab. So that means harvests decline sharply, I mean, you know, as anyone could have predicted. But the geniuses running the government did not predict this. So you get peasant rebellions everywhere. You get strikes in the cities over food shortages, general unrest everywhere. Lenin's response, the military, poison gas. But even he realized that would ultimately not be enough. And as we'll see in the future, he is going to uh, have to compromise by means of the new economic policy. Let's talk for a minute about the Red Terror. This really defined the government policy pretty much for the entire history of the regime, but certainly from the very beginning, we see an attempt really to terrorize the general public so that they would feel utterly helpless and they would resign themselves to being governed by this regime. One feature of it was the 1918 execution of Tsar Nicholas II and his family. And the argument was, we have to execute him or otherwise he will be a rallying point for all our enemies, a rallying point for people who uh, might want to overthrow the communist regime. They'll rally to, to, to Nicholas, and he will be a symbol that they can rally to in their attempts at overthrow. But this is, I mean, nobody today really believes that as the rationale. There are a lot of things you could have done to prevent this. You could have moved him around. Uh, you could have kept him under house arrest or whatever to prevent anything like that from happening. Uh, Leon Trotsky gives the real reason for why they they murdered both him and his wife and his whole family. They were all butchered. And and by the way, the, the, the Bolsheviks knew this was an act of barbarism. In fact, they concealed it from the Germans. They they told the Germans that that uh, Nicholas II had been killed, but his family was safely living somewhere. They they covered it up because they even they knew that it was it was barbaric. Trotsky said this. The decision, meaning the decision to execute Nicholas and his family, was not only expedient but necessary. The severity of this punishment showed everyone that we would continue to fight mercilessly, stopping at nothing. The execution of the Tsar's family was needed not only to frighten, horrify, and instill a sense of hopelessness in the enemy, but also to shake up our own ranks, to demonstrate that there was no retreating that ahead lay either total victory or total doom. 
Then we have the founding in 1917, we actually, December 1917, I also want to mention the founding of the Cheka, which was the first iteration of the Russian, uh, the communist secret police. It would eventually morph into the NKVD and then into the more familiar uh, rendering, the KGB, the, the much feared KGB. Now it's true that the Tsar had his own secret police, but the communist secret police was 16 times larger than the Tsar's secret police. So it's not always the case in history that your choice is between a bad guy and a good guy. A lot of times it's a bad guy and a much worse guy. And that's what we see here with the case of the Tsars and the communists. Now note also on the slide, I have a quotation. This is from historian Richard Pipes. Soviet Russia was the first state in history to outlaw law. What on earth could that mean? What Pipes means is that under the Soviet regime, what you in fact had was the outlawing of law in the sense that all the accumulated precedent and legal codes and everything else was eventually, was ultimately going to be swept away. We don't need that anymore. That's, that's bourgeois. We don't need that anymore. Instead, judges, instead of ruling according to these old laws, which were probably devised just to prop up the status quo, judges should rule according to revolutionary conscience. Whatever their revolutionary Marxist conscience tells them is the thing to do is what they ought to do. So in other words, you have judges behaving completely arbitrarily according to no fixed rules. In fact, you didn't even need any formal education, much less a law degree, to be a judge in communist Russia. You just needed basic literacy. You can read and write, you can be a judge. Lenin said that the task of the communist judiciary was to provide, quote, a justification of terror. The court is not to eliminate terror, but to substantiate it and legitimize it. That's what Pipes means by outlawing law. There is no rule of law that people can expect to be governed by. There are no fixed rules that people can expect to be applied impartially. There are simply judges with no legal training, rendering decisions not according to any existing bodies of law, but according to whatever they think revolutionary morality demands at that moment. That's the Bolshevik regime in a nutshell. We're going to wrap things up with a few miscellaneous items. The new economic policy, that's actually the official name of it, the new economic policy, NEP or NEP, was announced in 1921. Now, this is after the communists have turned Russia into a complete basket case. Uh, industrially, agriculturally, in every way, the place is a basket case. And what what Lenin is going to do is to allow some market exchange to be reintroduced. That is to say, get the government out of at least some private exchange, let people buy and sell on a small scale, and to not to engage in the kind of warfare on the peasants that he'd been engaged in in the countryside. So Lenin referred to this as a policy of two steps forward, one step back. In other words, the new economic policy was one step back. But we've taken two steps forward in the revolution. Certainly, we've moved toward the goal we're trying to reach. And sometimes nece it's necessary for strategic reasons to take a temporary step back to consolidate your gains, and then someday you'll be able to move forward once again. So there would be no more grabbing of food by government goons. Peasants would pay a tax in kind and then be able to sell in the open market. A limited amount of private business was allowed to operate, as I, as I noted to you. But all this attempt to try and, try and put a stop to the total insanity in Russia was too late to prevent a horrifying famine, which was provoked by, initially by a drought. But there are droughts in capitalist countries all over the world, and, and we don't have famines uh, resulting from them. Of course, it was the crazy communist policies that had result, that had uh, laid the groundwork for it. It was the worst famine suffered by any European country to that point, and it claimed 5.2 million lives. Now, let's say a little something about cultural and spiritual life. This, too, was uh, very much dominated and influenced by communism. They, 
they were the communists were totalitarians. They 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 wanted the state to control every aspect of life. So even music, even musicians feel like they've got to go with the flow. They've got to uh, be part of the communist message. So instead of having let's say symphony orchestras performing works with string instruments and wind instruments as you would expect it became fashionable to put on concerts using not musical instruments but using the kinds of implements that proletarians used that were that industrial workers used the whole regime is supposedly organized around the welfare of industrial workers although we've seen workers suffered tremendously under this regime uh, but all the same Therefore, that would mean that in music, we should have music using proletarian implements. So let, let me just read you a passage. This is from uh, Richard, Pice, uh, Richard Pipes's work. He says, the instruments were not winds and strings, but motors, turbines, and sirens. <laughs> what a bunch of idiots. An officially designated noise master replaced the conductor. Symphonies of factory whistles. A factory whistle, that's part of a worker's life, so let's make a symphony out of that. Symphonies of factory whistles performed in Moscow produced such bizarre sounds that the audiences could not recognize even familiar tunes. The new genre had its greatest triumph in the presentation in Baku in 1922 on the fifth anniversary of the October Revolution. In a concert performed by units of the Caspian Fleet, foghorns, factory sirens, two batteries of artillery, machine guns, and airplanes. So you understand, those were the musical instruments in the music. Hmm. Also, in the Russian, the Russian Orthodox Church was by far the dominant religious institution in Russia. There was a small minority of Russian Catholics as well, but both the Orthodox and the Catholics were ordered to hand over the valuables in their churches. And the rationale for this was that there was a famine going on in Russia, and surely the churches were not going to be enemies of the people by selfishly hoarding their prized valuables when we could take those valuables, melt them down, and sell them in exchange for money that we can use to feed the people. Well, the Russian Orthodox tried uh, valiantly to prevent this from happening. Uh, the R Russian Catholics did as well. There were priests that tried, and, and laymen, who tried to block entrances into churches, people who were arrested over this, uh, as the, the Russian goons went into the churches and confiscated uh, things like chalices, for example, sacred vessels, that it was considered a, a, great, uh, a great act of irreverence and uh, blasphemy to, uh, to, to indeed to melt down and to return to secular use. Now, it turns out, by the way, that the, the money that was received from this was, of course, not used for famine relief. I assume you didn't need me to tell you that. Uh, they used it to buy weapons from Germany. That's basically what they used the money for. The point of doing this, and this was Lenin's deliberate policy, was to strike at the churches, was to weaken them, was to have a confrontation with them in which the Bolsheviks would be victorious, in which the churches would look like enemies of the people, and in which the Bolsheviks could try to portray themselves as being the friends of the people. This was all a calculated campaign. So that's why what's interesting to note here is the intervention at that time of Pope Benedict the Fifteenth, who was Pope from uh, 1914 to 1922. And Benedict XV had contacted Lenin and said, we in the Vatican will send you a check for an amount of money equivalent to the monetary value of the valuables in the Russian Catholic churches so that you will not have to melt them down to get your money. We'll send you the money if you spare the valuables. Lenin completely ignored this offer because, of course, he wanted to melt down the valuables because he, he hated the churches. They were his enemy. Uh, as Marx d did, of course, hated the churches. They were officially atheist. And he also wanted, given that the churches were a competing power center, he wanted to crush them. And this was a way to humiliate them and to, to teach them a lesson, in effect, of who was really in charge. Moreover, religious instruction was outlawed. Churches were closed. Uh, not all of them, but some were closed and turned to secular use. Uh, I, there, I can think of at least one example of a church that was closed and then replaced by uh, public bathrooms. Well, that's not a very subtle message that's, that's being sent there. I have a, uh, a late friend who took a guided tour of 
of uh, Moscow and in, in back in uh, oh maybe the 1970s or 80s. And he, the tour guide, of course, is a communist who's just shelling out communist propaganda. And the tour guide said, oh, we have absolute freedom of religion here in Russia. And look at the many beautiful churches we have in Russia. And my friend raised his hand and said, uh, how many of those churches were built after 1917, like after the communists took power? And, of course, the tour guide went completely silent because the answer is obviously zero. By 1922, Lenin was frustrated by everything that was going on. His health was failing, and he lashed out. He ordered hundreds of opposition scholars, economists, and philosophers simply sent into exile without explanation. He died the following year, 1923. There was no provision for his replacement, and so now jockeying for power and influence will begin and will eventually culminate in Joseph Stalin who makes Lenin uh, look like uh, a child in terms of the, the sheer scope of his destruction. But my old professor, Vladimir Brovkin, said, you know, especially in a place like uh, Harvard and Harvard Square and Cambridge, Massachusetts, there was a good Lenin, bad Stalin myth that Lenin was basically a good guy and then Stalin was bad. He came around, he was bad. But when you look through the history, uh, Lenin was, uh, well, I'll let you judge for yourselves, I suppose. I strongly urge the, the Richard Pipes book, A Concise History of the Russian Revolution. Paul Johnson is also very good on the Russian Revolution. Thanks for watching. All right, everybody, that's it. But I do want to tell you, I'm going to count this as a double episode because the next episode I want to run on this show is also over an hour. And I'm afraid two hour-long shows back-to-back -back is going to get people's listening clogged up and it's a lot of listening to do and... I do want, you know, ideally I'd like people to listen to as many of these as I can. So we're going to count this as a double episode. We'll start again on Monday. And on Monday I've got a, a one you're really, really going to enjoy. I'll just put it that way. And then, of course, Contra Krugman coming up this week, my sister podcast over at ContraKrugman.com. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.